most of our fears are stuff in the past or stuff in the future, right? It could happen or it did happen and I want it not to happen again. So if I remove past and future, stress hormones literally are flushed out of our system and joy, euphoria, all those things go away. The first thing I wanna ask you about is what's happening in the human mind, the human brain, the human body, when we are in a state of flow? What's actually going on? Scale of one to 10, how technical an answer do you want? I want to go full on, <laughs> balls <laughs> deep. All right. Technical. Um, so you know when you're sort of describing brain function, you want to know four things, really. You want to know neurochemistry and neuroelectricity. The neuroelectricity is not a term anybody uses, it's brain waves, right? But that's the two ways the brain talks to itself and to the body, right? It uses chemicals, uses electrical signals. So that's communication. And then the other things you want to know are neural anatomy, where in the brain something is taking place. And since, as I'm sure you know, very little in the brain happens totally like in one spot, right? It's usually a network effect. So really what you want to know about is functional connectivity and anatomical connectivity, the network effect of the brain. So networks, neural anatomy, neuroelectricity, neurochemistry, those are sort of the four things you want to sort of have some idea about if you're talking about what's going on in the brain. So during flow, right, flow is an optimal state of consciousness. We feel our best, we perform our best. We see shifts at every one of these levels, big changes. Let's just start uh, with simple neural anatomy. In flow, the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your brain that's right back here, right, be right behind your forehead, very potent portion of the brain, right, does executive control, long-term planning, logical decision-making, morality lives there, willpower lives there. This portion of the brain deactivates during flow. We used to think it was sort of like an across-the-board shutdown, and I'll talk about why in a half a second. Now we know it's more sort of localized depending on what you're doing, right, so it's task-localized. Um, meaning different areas will shut down, not just across the boards. Though there's still some debate about that. Um, and it's it's really about efficiency. So the first order of business for the brain and the body is save energy. So in flow, because the brain is a fixed energy budget, and flow, one of its core characteristics is complete concentration on the task at hand. So the brain needs lots of energy to focus on the thing that's directly in front of you so you can get absorbed in it and lost in it and all that. It shuts down non-critical structures and it repurposes that energy for attention. Mm -hmm. A lot of what gets shut down is in the prefrontal cortex. So some flow is really strange effects. So when we're in a flow state, our sense of self disappears, right? Self, self-consciousness, bodily awareness will disappear sometimes. And we have this experience all the time. So like low-grade flow states was known as microflow, really common at work. You go to work, you sit down to write a quick email to your colleague, and it's just supposed to take five minutes. You get so lost in what you're doing, you end up writing an essay, it takes an hour, and maybe your whole sense of self didn't disappear, but bodily awareness sure did, because when you pop back in, you're like, oh crap, an hour's gone by, you have to go to the bathroom, and you didn't notice, right? That happens to all of us all the time, right? That's really common. And time distorts in flow. Most commonly, just get so sucked into what you're doing that five hours pass by in like five minutes. Sometimes you get a freeze frame effect for me in a car crash. So why are these really weird things happening in flow? Big portion of the reason is the prefrontal cortex is deactivating. Your sense of time, for example, calculated all over the prefrontal cortex, it's essentially a network effect. And as parts of the cortex shut down, there are other things that tilt time strains in the brain but generally as parts of the cortex shut down we lose the ability to separate past from present from future we're plunged into what people talk about as the eternal present the deep now huge impact on performance by the way big impact right think about anxiety has a huge negative effect on performance a little bit is okay primes learning prime focus doesn't but too much really blocks performance and sort of crushes us and um, most of our fears, most of our anxieties are not in the present moment. Unless you're in action sports, in combat sports, in a combat situation, fighting with your wife, you know, a handful of situations that we encounter in the real world, most of our fears are stuff in the past or stuff in the future, right? It could happen, oh, it did happen, and I want it not to happen again. So if I remove past and future, stress hormones literally are flushed out of our system and uh, joy, euphoria, all those things go way up. Same thing with your sense of self. 
self is a network effect. It's a bunch of parts of the brain talking to each other. Most of them are in the prefrontal cortex. There's some are deeper in the brain. And when those parts shut down, our sense of self, including the voice in our head, that nagging always on inner critic, gets really, really quiet. So that's what's going on neuroanatomically, more discrete levels. At a slightly larger level, you see a coordination between what's known as the frontal uh, control network, cognitive control, which allows you to stay focused on the task at hand, block out all those other distractions and that sort of stuff, and the goal-directed network, which is, so at a network level, those two things, um, they're either, to use technical words, metastable, which is Scott Kelso's argument, and I am sort of leaning in that direction, though in a recent paper, we argued that it was synchronous activity because that's what showed up in the data, and my, my colleague Richard Husky has has sort of found that, though even he sort of to doubt his data because we think it's a metastable system, but that's complexity dynamics and probably not a level you wanted to go to. So let's switch to neurochemistry now. Inflow, we see five of the most potent reward chemicals the body and brain can produce all flood our system at once. And they're performance enhancers and they're pleasure chemicals. And you're familiar with some of dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, anandamide, endorphins. And um, when we talk about flow underpinning happiness and well-being and meaning and purpose and joy and all that stuff, these neural chemicals are a large reason why. Just to give you an idea of pleasure-wise, okay? So when we fall in love, which is one of the best feelings on earth, that feeling of romantic love is dopamine and norepinephrine being cocktail. It's two out of these five chemicals. So imagine like falling in love plus a whole lot more pleasure that gets you flow so that's why when people you know rate their favorite experiences on earth it's always a flow state these neurochemicals are why that's why we see this enormous surge in motivation when mckinsey the business consultancy wanted to know how much more productive top executives were in flow than out of flow they did a 10-year study and the average response was 500 percent more productive which is crazy right in means you can go to work on monday and flow take Tuesday through Friday off and get as much done as your steady state peers, which also tells you at the Flow Research Collective, my organization, right? We, we train a lot of companies. That's one of the reasons why, mm -hmm. right? Because companies are doing this, more and more companies are doing this and you've got to stop and you're like, well, if company A does this and they're a thousand percent more productive than the competition because their employees are now being able to spend a couple days a week in flow versus the comp, right? It's, this is becoming one of those factors in business where you, you have to do it kind of thing. Um, you also see these same neurochemicals impact learning and memory. So quick shorthand, how does learning and memory work in the brain? The more neurochemicals that show up during experience, better chance it'll move from short-term holding into long-term storage. Another thing neurochemicals do, they tag experiences. Super important, safe for later, right? Flow is this huge dump. Neurochemistry, which is why in studies done by the US Defense Department, soldiers in flow learn 240 to 500% faster than normal. Huge spike in, in, in learning and memory. All that comes down to these, these really big surge of neurochemicals. We also see stress hormones and stress chemicals flush out of our system as we move into flow. It resets mm -hmm. the nervous system, uh, which has, you know, we're going to talk about peak performance aging as, as, as we go on in our country. So there are nine known causes of aging, and they're all linked to stress and inflammation. So one, flow is a very potent anti-aging medicine, maybe one of the most potent. One of the reasons is because it flushes these stress hormones out of our system and it resets the nervous system. And that anything that does that, anything that resets the nervous system is essentially an anti-aging technology. So that's a look at kind of networks, neuron ions. The last thing we want to talk about is brain waves and mm. right, neural electricity. And so when you and i are in conversation you're awake alert we're talking your brain is producing a beta wave it's a fast moving wave it wake and alert is what it basically means below that's a slightly slower wave that's an alpha wave this is daydreaming mode it's basically when the brain is inactive its stuff is shut down it's a slower wave and then below that is theta theta is a much slower wave it tends to show up during rem sleep or sometimes during focused attention which is why you see it so much in flow um Flow takes place on the borderline between alpha and theta. We don't stay there permanently. You're not living there. You Every time you make a decision, and flow is a decision-making state, you'll bounce around. You'll go up to beta. You'll come. But the difference like between peak performers, when you look at what is the difference in the brain between peak performers and average people when they're, when they're doing something, 
one of it is average folks will go into a decision making cycle and they'll, they'll go to beta or high beta or some of these like non flowy brainwave states and they'll get stuck there they'll stay there um, high beta is anxiety so like your brain will start worrying about something and you'll just stay there but the pros they may start worrying about it but they'll get their brain back to this alpha theta borderline they can come back to flow so i can go a lot deeper but this is this is a lot deeper than i'll normally go on, on, on a podcast I love it. this so, is wonderful all right. you know having this 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 is a a language for us to really start to well we're yeah and, and i mean you're speaking the preaching to the choir we emphasize the flow research collective cognitive literacy and it's super yes, important yes under we want to perform at our best understand what's going on in our brain and exactly. our body when we perform that language is power yeah so yeah i'm, I'm a I'm, big advocate even you know physical literacy you know putting some of these practices for our bodies and kind of learning a certain language but this all really leads to for me just even at the the tail end of that being able to access one of the greatest human capacities, which is the capacity for creativity, right? And you just mentioned yeah, so bouncing create, up to like yeah, beta. So create, yeah, creativity spikes massively in flow. A lot of it is those neurochemicals. Yeah. So creativity is a combinatory process, always. It's the brain taking in novel information or you're internally generating a novel thought. And it combines it with older ideas to produce something startling new. So all those neurochemicals surround information processing in the brain you're going to love the following sentence <laughs> when we're in flow um we take in more information per second so data acquisition goes up pay more attention to that incoming information so salience goes up we find faster connections between that incoming information and older ideas so pattern recognition goes up that's your creativity and we find faster and farther flung connections so divergent thinking outside the box thinking that also happens and finally you know, in all the studies of creativity, it's def creativity is defined as the creation of something novel and useful. And the useful part means I, it's not enough for me to have a neat idea. That's not creativity. I have to do something within the world, right? The action matters, and that requires risk-taking. And in flow, these same neurochemicals, especially dopamine, boost risk-taking. So literally, they surround the creative process. It's why creativity spikes are the highest in flow above anything else that's been measured. 400 to 700%, depending on which aspect of creativity we're measuring or looking at. And that's work we did, worked on at Harvard, worked on at the University of Sydney, a couple other places. So, and as you pointed out, the brain waves, when you're down around alpha theta, those are really creative. Like alpha waves have long been correlated with creativity for a really long time. And so, yeah flow is incredibly great for creativity and i cut you off because i got all excited yeah i love it listen you know it, in that same vein with creativity it's one of the most efficacious ways to problem solve for you know sure. and number one and right now we've, we're dealing with an abundance of problems as a species but we tend to hammer away at things being in that beta state like I'm just problem i'm gonna fix this i'm gonna you know that kind of thing it's a norepinephrine problem actually uh. so the part of our brain is the anterior cingulate cortex, very involved in flow, that if you're, it, if you're gripped, if you're freaked out, if you're scared, if the world today, and that's always, are you producing a lot of norepinephrine, which underpins anxiety, it, the brain, when you're anxious, it wants logical solutions. Try, true, something that's worked a million times. Don't give me anything new. Give me the thing that's worked a million times. And when we're in a good mood, when we're not time stressed, when we're less fearful, that part of the brain, the anterior cingulate cortex, which finds links between weakly associated ideas or remotely associated ideas, outside the box thinking, it's fully active. So the more fearful we are, the less creative we are. This plays a big role in sort of peak performance aging um, where you really have to stay on top of anxiety levels uh, to, to really sort of exceed in the second half of your life, that's for sure. What about this phenomenon of people having their best ideas in a shower? So that we have to go all the way back to this sort of Poincaré and Wallace, the foundation of creativity. They realized uh, Poincaré was a mathematician in the late 1800s. Wallace uh, was a psychologist in like 1925. They came up with the idea of that creativity is a cycle. It's a four stage process. There's a loading phase. Um, then it's followed by an incubation phase, which is what happens in the shower, right? Where it ha your subconscious, your loading phase, you're just thinking about things consciously, so you're and right? And then you marinate, you pass the problem to the unconscious, 
And the reason the shower works, and this, so you can also, in flow, flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. One of them is sometimes talked about as deep embodiment. It basically means when multiple senses are active at once, we're much more engaged in the present, right? This is why athletic activity is so, one of the reasons it's so flowy is because when you're doing something athletic, you're using all your senses. There's no time for a whole lot else, right? So in the shower, in the same way, you've got a lot of sensory information sort of coming in all over your system. So it tends to drive focus towards flow a little bit, but it's also this incubation phase. So you're just taking your mind off the problem subconscious is chewing on it and then this this being you're being pushed a little bit towards flow and that's what we think is going on in the, with the good ideas in the shower that's so cool and i think that we could and this is what i love about your work is it's not even a matter of thinking it's a matter of we can create the conditions to stimulate or create much higher likelihood of reaching that flow state yeah i mean that's what we do with the flow research collective and just to put a, a, a point on so I'll talk about how we train it in a second, but the, let me just say this for everybody. Flow is, we're all biologically hardwired for flow, right? Built-in property of being human. We all come with peak performance built into us. But at the collective, we train uh, tens of thousands of people every month. We, my point is we do it in 130 countries. Everybody from, you know, soccer moms and soccer dads to professional athletes and members of the U.S. Special Forces to companies like Facebook and Accenture and the San Francisco Police Department, blah, blah, blah huge wide assortment that's my point and we measure everything we're total data geeks on average we see a 70 to 80 percent boost in flow and it's not i mean yes our kung fu is very good and we think i think we're the best in the world at this particular thing that said we're getting those results because this is so trainable because we're hardwired for this um so you know, I said earlier, flow states have triggers and there's a flow cycle. Like there's a creative cycle, there's a flow cycle. It actually maps onto the creative cycle very closely. And nobody knows, are you looking at the same thing or two different things? We can't, nobody's been able to figure that out yet. We don't know. But if you know the flow cycle, it's a map of the process, right? So where am I in this process? And if you know the triggers, what can I do to get more flow or to sustain the flow that I'm getting? You, those are the, that's the toolkit. And once you're armed with that toolkit, and a little bit of cognitive literacy, 70 80% boost in flow is what's kind of, I think, available to most of us. That's mm. certainly what all our data says. That's scary good. I know, That's right? scary good. Scary. And it's, again, it's, we're addressing, I, I truly believe that whenever we are faced with a problem, whether it's personally or even as a species, the problem existing is automatically going to have a solution packaged with. It's kind of like, two sides of the same coin. There's there's always a way. And there, of course, there's this statement where there's a will, there's a way. I believe where there's a will, there's a thousand ways, 10,000 ways, but it's our ability to think differently a lot of times, but we handicap ourselves when we're trying to, as Einstein said, solve a problem from the same level of thinking that created the problem, right? And so having this come up right now where we're dealing with some pretty serious issues as a species, you know, our collective demise, and also seeing this advent of, we just crossed 8 billion people on the planet recently, while at the same time we have plummeting rates of fertility as a species. It's been going down about 1% every year for the past 50 years. The Scientific American did a great job kind of encapsulating a bunch of different studies to, to lay it all out. And so with that said, paying attention to how long we can live and how long we can live healthfully is a big deal. And you saying today just blew my mind when you said that this is anti-aging technology and having the data to back that up, it is so awesome. And this is something, we got the practical stuff out here, go get your steps in, eat healthy foods, but also put on your list of to-dos, flow well, the, state. Yeah, well, the so and this is really what's at the center in our country, right? Is if you really look at the sort of the data on anti-aging and longevity and, and those sorts of things, um, the biggest levers, the biggest things that we have available to us are almost all psychological, Facts. right? Mindset has a huge impact on how long we live. Social connection, huge impact on how long we live. Regular access to feelings of mastery and control, which show up in flow, huge, 
hugely important to how long and how well we live. And I keep going. It goes on and on. Feelings of purpose. If you, yeah. If you actually like, I, you know, so peak performance aging in a single sentence, right? This is, if you want to rock to you drop, you want to regularly engage in challenging, creative, and social activities that demand dynamic. Dynamic just means all five categories of functional fitness, strength, stamina, agility, balance, flexibility at once. Dynamic, deliberate play, and we can talk about what deliberate play means in a second, and take place in novel outdoor environments. Nowhere in that sentence, that's those are all the big levers put together. Now, a bunch of those words are flow triggers, so flow comes baked into that, but Nowhere in there did you hear a biohack? Did you hear a supplement? Did you hear a dietary suggestion? Like all the things, I'm not saying those things are bad. They're good too, right? But I have said that like most of the stuff that people do, they're reaching for the wrong things first. They're, you know, not figuring out that the big, you know, the big levers are, are elsewhere. The other one is leg strength, right? Leg strength is the single most in court important correlate for peak performance aging, for longevity, for maintaining brain function over time, for maintaining body function, and it's literally like thigh muscle mass. Um, so like, it's funny because people were talking about, oh, should we test Biden's cognitive function or all, all this stuff, right? Because we got older. Okay. And I was like, well, really what you want the dude to do is squat. You want to know what his, his mm -hmm. thighs can do. That's probably a better indicator. That's amazing. Okay. I, know, I know my son is over there. He's got some. You see those thighs? You see those busting through the Jesus. little pants over there. <laughs> but that's an indication again of of robust cognitive function. And you know, there's this really strange stereotype that you know the the athletes or the jocks are not intelligent. The dumb jock, right? We were Ryan and I were just Ryan's again off screen. Uh, uh, we were talking about this the other day. I, you know, I grew up in the 70s and 80s and that i mean it was it was dumb jocks right it wasn't the research, the first research that linked brain performance to body stuff was the famous it's the first major study it's the study so the traditional idea is about aging right the long slow rot theory all of our mental skills decline over time all of our physical skills decline over time there's nothing we can do to stop a slide we now know that's totally not true, right? We now know that all those skills are actually use it or lose it skills. And if you keep training them, you can hold on to them, even extend them for far longer. So that showed up. One of the first big studies was the nun study of, uh, it was a study of, of nuns and they were looking at who develops Alzheimer's and why it was lifestyle factors and all that stuff. And they were the first study that showed that exercise preserves cognitive function. And this was like 1995, 1996, I think. I have to go back into the physiology literature, but we were talking about it. I think that's the study that actually was the first hole in the dumb jock myth. Um, I could be wrong. Maybe there was stuff that came back before we were talking about it. I was like, I think that's the, that's the one that sort of blew it up. And just to piggyback on that, we've got a study. This was conducted by researchers at Georgia Tech. Okay. And it revealed that strength training for as little as 20 minutes can improve long-term memory. And the researchers had study participants specifically train the legs for 20 minutes versus controls who did nothing. So how old were the participants, did it say? So these would be, I would imagine these would be college students. But two days later, they had them to do an image recall test. And the strength training test subjects outperformed the non-lifters by 10%, right? And so this, this the, uh, you know what spins off of this that's really cool? And not, not enough people are talking about it is we're starting to get to the point that like, we're being able like that's strength training right and we know like physical stamina endurance training is good for certain things bad for others strength training for memory like it's we're getting really specific with these links is is I, and there's still much work to be done and i'm hesitant to make this is this because i don't think we're at that level yet but this is definitely the where the research is and over the next five to ten years we're gonna have you're gonna go to the doctor and he's gonna say oh you're this is your issue, this is your issue, this is your issue. You're gonna like a combination of play these video games and do these exercises in the gym. And it's gonna be so unbelievably personalized and specific, it's gonna get really neat. Yeah, yeah, I hope that you're right. Me too. I hope that you're Me right. Too. Me too, I could be wrong. I've be been wrong before. So I wanna ask you, because even with that, when we are engaging in an activity like that, training legs, we're putting ourselves in a territory of certain outcomes. Might not be, again, the direct causative agent for the thing. And the same thing holds true if we're talking about practices that are, are gonna put us 
in flow territory. So that's what I want to talk about now. But what are some of those practices? Let's just start with what I call the peak performance basics, which are, um, and this is really like, there's 30 years of sort of positive psychology asking the questions. If you want to be at your best, what, like what's baseline? What, like, what, what, what's non-negotiable? What do we have to have? And, and then we can get more advanced and talk about flow triggers and, and stuff like that, but what's basic? I won't linger on a lot of these because they're very obvious and I know you've covered a lot of them on, on the show. So obviously, sleep matters. Flow is a high energy state. So you need seven to eight hours a night regularly. Can you get into a flow state occasionally if you didn't get that amount of sleep? Yes, of course you can. Um, and that happens a lot. But general rule, if you want to make flow reliable and repeatable in your life, you want to make people for, get to sleep seven to eight hours a night. That's just what it is. Hydration and nutrition. Wait, really? we got to go back on this one. Okay. Because there's two things that will come up for me. Number one is we have a reduced activity in that prefrontal cortex when we're sleep deprived. So is that moving into that territory? But then it brings up the question of stress that would happen. With yeah, the we're way too much norepinephrine. We're way too, there's yeah. way too much anxiety. Um, and yes, uh, Yes, you see a do a do see a reduction uh, of activity in the prefrontal cortex with sleeplessness, but it's the wrong band of mm -hmm. if you're dealing with like neuroelectricity or brain waves, it's in the wrong spectral bands. It does the wrong thing. So yes, but not exactly. So um, sleep de deprivation it, isn't yeah, a good well, way to well, hack well, your you, way in. I mean, you certainly can hack your consciousness and alter your consciousness. I mean, people have been using that in mystical systems forever, right? As sleep deprivation as one way of inducing altered states of consciousness. Um, not flow. You can you can alter your consciousness, but it's it's not ideal for flow. Um, and it is. Uh, and seven eight hours is is pretty much a non negotiable, right? Like they've a lot of people tested other things. I always love. This is what I always tell people when I get pushback on that, is I'm like, look, don't take my word for it. There are IQ tests that are all over the internet for free. One day when you've slept seven eight hours, take an IQ test. Wait a couple weeks till you get four hours, five hours of sleep, one night, six hours, and take the same IQ test and just compare. You'll like, it'll, it'll, it's end of conversation, right? It's end of discussion. You're like, oh my God, I'm that much stupider when, when, when sleepy? Holy crap, you won't do it again. It sort of cures that, especially if you do anything where you need your brain for a living, right? You, you, just... you know, one of the most eye-opening studies for me, this was years ago I came across, this was published in The Lancet, and they took physicians and they had them to do a simulated oh God. operation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they sleep deprived them for just 24 hours and had them come back and do the same simulated operation. They, oh, wow. they made 20% more mistakes. Oh, I'd love to see that. Doing study. the exact yeah, yeah. same thing. Yeah, yeah. And it took them 14% longer, longer as well to do this. Oh, exact I really same want to find thing. that study. That's so, that's cool. That's a great study. Yeah. yeah. Um, hydration, nutrition matters. And here's, so, uh, there's, when I talk about the peak performance basics, let me put a frame around it. There's three things on the physical side, three things on the mental side. On the physical side, to maintain the energy levels we need for peak performance, hydration, nutrition, um, sleep. And the third one is unusual to people, maintaining robust social connections. So we know the importance of social connections, psychological health. People don't understand there's an energy penalty for not maintaining robust social connections. So whenever you face a situation, X happens. Could be a threat, could be a problem, gotta run away, could be a challenge that I wanna to rise towards. And whenever we, that happens, that happens all day long, right? Um, the brain does a very quick calculation, threat or challenge, threat or challenge, right? Part of that calculation is, do you have friends? Do you have people who love you? Mm -hmm. Do you have backup? If you try this thing and fall down, is somebody going to pick you up again, right? Because if there's nobody, this is a big problem. And we got to produce a load of energy to make sure you can tackle it. And we need a bunch of fear. And that takes even more energy. And you do that over time and you no longer have the energy to get into flow, right? So maintaining, and you know, I'm an introvert. I don't, Right, I mean, I can maintain robust social. I need to talk to my wife for like 20 minutes a day. My wife is an introvert too, so like we're both wired that way. But like we literally, like I can talk to, we can talk to each other for about 20 minutes a day and I can hang out my dogs and that's often enough for me, right? But to maintain robust, I, every day, no matter what, I make, I try to make one or two phone calls just out into the ether, 
you, you know, folks I haven't seen in a little while. Hey, how are you? I love you. What's going on? That sort of stuff. Cause I, do, I want that energy level. So that's on the physical side. On the mental side, we've talked a bunch about how anxiety blocks flow. So there are three, three of the best long-term anti-anxiety strategies are a daily gratitude practice, regular exercise, or mindfulness. And what I tell people is, um, and we could talk about the science of why they all worked at, at reducing stress, but like high level, they all reduce stress. Uh, daily gratitude actually will make you more flow prone too. We did some work with Glenn Fox at USC, who's a great gratitude researcher, neuroscientist. And we found that people with regular gratitude practices are more flow prone. Um, mm. And But what I tell people is if it's a normal day, do one to manicure your nervous system, right? If it's a little stressful of a day, do two of those things. And so like during COVID, if you worked for the Flow Research Collective, because we're a peak performance organization, and I want my people performing at their best, you had to do three a day. So if you worked for me during COVID, you were working out, meditating, and doing a daily gratitude practice, or you didn't, you know, didn't have a job, basically. I love it. This this one right here, you just said gratitude makes you more flow prone. Mm -hmm. That's one of the most remarkable statements that you shared thus far. That's that's pretty powerful. It's cool. We're doing a really, uh, we're doing a neat study uh, sometime in the next two or three months where we're going to look at gratitude as an acute intervention in a stressful situation. Um, we want to test it against like breathing and a couple other, because nobody's ever looked at like, um, they look at, gra they've looked at gratitude overall, like, you know, it will lower anxiety levels in your life. But we want to know, like an acute situation when we're forcing people to do something scary and dangerous, which is the better, you know, which is the best way to de-stress and, and drop into flow. We think gratitude is going to be pretty powerful. That's remarkable. We'll see. So this one, these three mental yeah, they, spaces. All, all so those we got... things are just trying to lower the amount of norepinephrine in your system, really, and cortisol in your system because too much. We'll talk about flow triggers in a second because this was basics, and you said, how do I manicure flow? I'll give you a couple flow trigger examples too, and this will make a little more sense. But the stress hormones block flow. Too much, you're just going to block flow, and you're going to block a lot of other things. Stress hormones block learning. They block creativity. They block flow. They slow down fast twitch muscle response as a general, unless you're in a full fight or flight mode, there's a general, they'll slow down fast twitch muscle response. They lessen the amount of uh, physical strength we can usually summon, right? Um, there's a big penalty for fear in the brain. A little bit is good, too much is, is a problem. So you gotta be constantly doing something to work with your nervous system. Now in acute situations, you know, in crisis modes, there's other techniques that are sort of better than those three for like, how do you sort of calm yourself down in the exact moment, but over the long term. And it, the one thing I want to say is if people are not used to exercising for cognitive function, for lowering anxiety levels, you want to exercise until there's a release of nitric oxide. That's what flushes the stress hormones out of your system. How do you know what when nitric oxide has been released? It's a gas signaling molecule. It's in every cell in the body, basically. When your lungs open up about 20 minutes into a workout, 25 minutes when your lungs open up and it starts to get quiet upstairs, that's nitrous oxide. It's now pushed the stress hormones out of your system. Your lungs have opened up, it's starting to get quiet upstairs. So you're exercising for calming down. You have to go until that happens, basically. So that's what you're looking for. If you're exercising for fitness or whatever, you know, you can get a high intensity workout in 10 minutes, but you may not get that that shift. Yeah. One of the things that you share with me before we even got rolling is, again, we can do all the things, but if we're hanging on to an, a barrier of entry into, into getting into a flow state, we're missing the point. And we were talking about how Locus of victimhood yeah. can be one of those things yeah, that so this acts is a, this as a barrier. Is just, yeah, this is just peak performance in general. This is the last thing that I should talk about is if you have an external locus of control. Locus of control is, do you think you have control over your world or do you think your world has control over you? Does life happen to you or do you get to steer a little bit? Internal locus of control, you get to steer. I'm in control of my life. I, maybe I'm not completely in control of my destiny, but I can shape it a lot and impact it. Victimhood is an external control. The world happens to me. There's nothing I can do. 
from a performance standpoint, if you have an external locus control, there is almost nothing I can do for you. Period. You've given up your you've given up all your power. People say that. What they don't realize is that's actual and talking about brain function too. If you have an external locus of control and you face a challenge, your brain will often not even like start producing the energy to even tackle the challenge because it knows, oh, this this is just something bad that happens to me and that's how life is and there's nothing I can do to fix it. So I'm not gonna waste the energy to bother trying. So yeah, the whole cult of trauma bonding that exists in the world today or out of the social justice movement, the whole cult of victimhood, right? I'm not saying the social justice movement is bad and I'm not saying that like people dealing with their traumas are bad. No, both of those things are great. But if you're giving up your power to be part of a community, which is what's happening when people are trauma bonding and whatever, they're choosing social relationships of, oh, we have this in common, we went through this hard thing and let's, right, over personal, over power, over ability to change it. And that's dangerous, right? We want the connection because it will help us get over the trauma, right? We don't want to keep our buried inside us. We know that bad idea, but we have to present it and share it in a way that is not, we can't be giving away our power because it has a direct impact on, on the brain and on performance and truly on the quality of our life right? Those are the kinds of decisions you don't think about it a lot, but over years that adds up into a lot of dissatisfaction with your life, you, really, um, and a lot of problems. So thank you for bringing that up. Of course, of course, you know, as I was sharing, it's, it's one of the prevalent things, you know, with social media today where, again, we might think that we can you know, escape essentially into these portals. And if our filter is such that we're looking for problems, if we're looking for the holes in everything and looking for a way to keep on putting off and disempowering ourselves from being able to make the change that we want. For example, uh, what came up for me when you were talking about this is I had a great social media shares on Instagram at million, I think it had like 6 million views, which is pretty cool. It was a health psychologist, Kelly McGonigal, and she was sharing these insights about exercise, essentially sensitizing the brain to more pleasure, which is the, the other aspect, so making you more sensitive to pleasure, and of course, reducing pain, reducing stress, right? So it has this two-prong approach that's just recently discovered. And of course, 95% of the folks, and I, I rarely ever dabble in the comments, but it got so big, and every time I would go into my app, it's just like all comments for that video. And you know, 95% of people is like, I feel the exact same way. It's just, you know, it's kind of affirming their experience. But, you know, it's those people just like, you know what? I've did, I exercised before. I just don't agree with this at all. This doesn't make me feel any better, da, da, da. And yes, absolutely. This can be subjectively true for that person. And maybe that's going to hand, handicap them or handcuff them from finding the thing that does help them to access, right? So maybe they've been going to the gym and, you know, running on the treadmill, maybe they yeah, they're, to, I mean, they're probably you, exercising in the wrong way for how they're that's, wired. There's, there's ways this, to go in a path of discovery. Well, this is where the flow triggers come in handy, right? Because everybody's individual and there are triggers that drive us into flow. Everybody's, there's 26 that we've discovered. There's probably way more, but there's, that's what we've discovered. Knowing which, and they change over time, right? Like which ones are going to work for you now are probably going to be different than what might work next week and five years from now and that sorts of, sorts of things. But knowing which triggers you're most susceptible to and, and, and work best with is a really good way to guide you towards, you know, exercise states um, where there's absorption. And if people are saying, I don't feel better, what they're really saying is I didn't work hard enough to get anandamide and endorphins, which are automatically released during exercise. and most common endorphin in the brain is a hundred times more potent than medical morphine. So you're gonna feel better. Like that's just biology. It's automatic. So like all you're saying is, wow, this exercise was so boring, was so wrong for me. I couldn't get absorbed and I couldn't get lost and I couldn't stick with it long enough to get the the kind of neurochemical release. And there are, um, we've been doing some work um, with uh, some neuroscientists who study pain and we're looking pain in, in relationship to working out in the gym. And 
some people really like it and, and, and understand that like, you know, this is a good thing. Other people, this is a bad thing depending. And so depending on your orientation towards physical discomfort in the gym, get different levels of flow, get blocked out of flow, different performance, all that kind of stuff. So there's, there's a lot of intricacy there and we're starting to peel it back a little bit. Of course, you know, and also we put exercise in this pithy box, you know, and if you think about our ancestors didn't necessarily have uh, regimented exercise programs, you know, they were just living, they were training, they were, you know, doing things to, you know, keep the tribe alive. And today we do simulations of things, but I think a more overarching way to really even picture this is through the lens of play. And you said this word earlier, because that play a lot of times is going to involve what we deem to be exercise oh, as sure. well. And it's going to put us more in that territory of a flow state. Yeah, I, play is ma massively conducive to flow. Um, obviously when animals play, you're just looking at pure flow, right? Um, in, in animals, uh, it's from a peak performance, peak performance aging perspective. I mean, we learn better when we play. So the reason I gave you that formula earlier, right, that had deliberate play in it, it's that's essentially a formula, among other things, for lifelong learning. You want to stave off cognitive decline. You want to preserve brain function, stave off Alzheimer's and dementia. What's the medicine? What works? Developing expertise and wisdom. This is why flow matters so much. Again, um, so most of the diseases of aging, cognitive decline, they take place in the prefrontal cortex, which really powerful part of your brain from an evolutionary perspective, it's the newest portion of the brain which makes it the most vulnerable to shit going wrong. And so when we learn skills, expertise, or when we learn wisdom, emotional intelligence, sort of writ large, um, either of those, the results are really diffuse networks all across the prefrontal cortex and the brain is really redundant. It doesn't ever figure out one way to do something. It figures out like 11 different ways to do something. So that's why there's so much, lifelong learning matters so much because you're developing expertise and wisdom and this is how what preserves brain function. So flow automatically, uh, for reasons we can talk about, uh, helps you develop expertise and wisdom. Um, so it's really good. Uh, one of the reasons it's an anti-aging medicine is, is this. Um, but that whole formula I gave you is for lifelong learning. And we learn better when we play. Deliberate play. So we've all heard about deliberate practice. Anders Ericsson's idea. 10,000 hours of do the same thing. Repetition with incremental advancement. Right? Do the same thing over and over and just advance it a little bit. And it turns out that's great for learning certain kind of skills. You want to become a classical violinist or a or mathematician or a couple things, this is the way you want to do it. That's the best way to learn. But in most other situations, deliberate play outperforms deliberate practice. What is deliberate play? Repetition without repetition. And so I'm going to do the same thing I did before. And I'm going to improvise a little bit on top of it. And one, it's way more fun. And so you get more neurochemicals that with deliberate practice, if you do the exact thing you're supposed to do, you'll get a little squirt of dopamine, a little squirt of dopamine, which is good, feel good drug, but not a lot of it. If it's deliberate play, you get dopamine and endorphins and you get a much bigger squirt of dopamine and a much bigger squirt of endorphins and the more neurochemicals that show up, better chance things are gonna move from short-term holding into long-term storage. Also, when you're playing, there's no shame, there's no self-consciousness, there's no embarrassment, there's no fear, all this that blocks learning and blocks performance is out of the picture. And when shame and self con those things, so all of those things live in the prefrontal cortex, right? And activate the prefrontal cortex, which will block flow. So deliberate play is way more flowy than deliberate practice as well. And the thing I like the most about it is with deliberate practice, there's only one right answer. You do the thing you did before, with get a little bit better, right? With deliberate play, there's only one wrong answer. You did the exact same thing you did before. Everything else is a right answer. And everything else is a chance to learn because it's play, right? When we're going for deliberate practice and we do something wrong, we don't get there, we beat ourselves up. When we're playing, it's all information. We're just learning. We're just all the time. So all of these things, and you know, play is better for 
I mean, we talk a lot about health and well-being and longevity and impact on the immune system and all those things. It's an incredibly powerful tool, and it's a tool that most adults stop doing, right? It, it tends mm -hmm. to go away over time, and sort of the exact opposite would be true. In fact, this is maybe the coolest thing. So in our country, I taught myself how to park ski in my 50s, right? And park skiing is a really acrobatic, dangerous discipline that involves doing a lot of jumps off, uh, tricks off jumps and things like that. There's a general thinking that if you haven't learned how to park ski over the age of 35, don't bother, right? It's, it's biologically impossible. By the time you're 45, you're crazy. And 50, you're just nuts. And I thought that was wrong. And I thought, that, you know, there's a bunch of science that said that was wrong. And clearly, I, I, you know, I tried to prove it in the book and, and I think it did. But um, one of the reasons I thought it was wrong is you've heard about the motor learning window, right? If you're a little kid, learn gymnastics or ballet or a language or a musical instrument and that window slams shut almost completely by the time we're 20, 25. That's not actually true. Sorta true. There's some changes in the brain. Those things happen. But really what changes is how we learn. When we're kids, we learn by playing, mm -hmm. right? When we're adults, we learn through work. And there's a very different thing going on in the brain. And it turns out that when you learn through playing, that the motor w learning window is not as slammed shut as it appeared to be. So if we rekindle this learning system that we had as kids, we actually can reopen that motor learning window too. That reminds me of the great quote, uh, we don't stop playing because we get old. We get old because we stop, stop playing. playing. Yeah, yeah. And this is a great segue into your new book, Nar Country, which we got to talk about the title, all first right. of all. But also, in the book, you share this statement, and it was really profound. You said that skiing is the ultimate life hack for you personally. Yeah, yeah. It's the ult you said it's the ultimate life hack for you. Why did you say that? So we were talking about this earlier. So the most precious resource most of us have is time, right? Some people could argue it's money. But um, often money is just a substitute for time, right? And what money really does is allows you to get stuff done faster one way or another. So time strikes me as the most sort of precious resource we have. And so I am always applying filters to my life, to helping me make decisions, right? And I love these filters, one, because in crisis situations and difficult situations, um, I'm not logical. I'm not, I'm like everybody else, right? I'm not logical. I'm not linear. I want the quick fix, the fast solution, all that stuff. So I like to have rules in place that govern my behavior in kinds of those kinds of situations. So I know what to do and I don't sort of do the wrong thing. One of the filters I apply is, um, we do this in our, in our, in our training. We have a training coming up performance aging training. And this is one of the first things we do in it. So we make people list their top 10 feelings on earth. What are the 10 things that make you feel the absolute best? Um, they could be activities. They could, you know, be whatever. And use that as a filter for how you spend your, if you have free time, right? Why would you waste free time on something that's like 17 or 27 on your list of like favorite things to do, right? First of all, so you start editing out like, these, these lesser pleasures in the favor of, oh wow, these are the things that really make my life rich and meaningful and delightful and produce a lot of flow and all that stuff. And so skiing has always been my, it's my favorite activity on earth. Um, close second to like writing and, you know, hanging out with my wife and, and, and whatever, but literally like skiing and flow is the best I get to feel on the planet. And that's literally just the reality of it. Like you, could have moral opinions about that or you can have a lot of judgments around that but just that's the flat truth of the matter one of the things i like about this list is oftentimes we have these like things that will make us say oh no this is my hanging out with my children or it's my favorite right because like society wants us to say those things and you start probing under the hood of that one and you find out no that's actually in a lot of cases not true it's like item maybe on the top 10 list but it's not actually one two or three and you're sort of acting like it is because you think you should, but you're sort of going against your wiring in a weird way. And um, is that the best for you? Is that the best example to set for your kids? Mm -hmm. Are you being the best version of you for your kids? If you're so, those are interesting questions. And I don't, I don't have children. 
so I'm not going to answer them. I'll let people who have children can have opinions on that one. But it always, I always listen to that. And I'm like, are you sure? Because, you know, <laughs> like I have these questions a lot, you know, these conversations a lot with people and, you know, so, but um, yeah, skiing is, is, has always been sort of my first filter. And what does that mean? That means like if somebody comes to me with a thing, my brain says, well, is this going to help me ski more or less? Because if it's going to help me ski less, it's probably a no, right? It's probably a no. Um, there are occasions when I deviate from that, but as a general rule, it's a no. And, you know, there's a, there's a handful of those. I have, I basically only do six things in my life and everything else is a no. Um, so you've taken control of your time. Yeah, very much so as much as I possibly can. Yeah. And you've given, here's the, the wonderful thing about your book. I shared this with you already is that there's a story of discovery and a, new form of skiing, which again, this is not my language. And even that I would think would be a barrier to discovery throughout the book, but it wasn't. It brought me right in, immediate interest. I'm trying to find out. Yeah, I can, You, you but, gave this but, statement, but, I gotta but, share this. I mean, I you gave the statement that as you get older, the distance between your ass oh, yeah. and the emergency room gets a lot shorter. At least according to the voice in my head. Right, and <laughs> yeah. so that's the thing. It's like you're going past and, and battling with these mental barriers but also the physical showing up part and you share this like the things you've been talking about is weaved into the book itself and one of the most profound things that you talked about was something that you called multi-tool solutions right so being able to leverage your time by stacking things right things that address two maybe yeah three multi-tool things at the same solutions time. a single uh so in peak performance also in peak performance aging there's a, a bunch of stuff you want to do. Really, if you if you go through my book, or Muzzle, I talk about it a little bit in here, there's about six or seven things you want to do every day. And I just, we talk about the peak performance basics, so you have an idea of what some of the, a lot of those things are. Um, and about six or seven things you want to do every week. Which is another way of saying, you know, peak performance is essentially a checklist, right? But it's every day, it's constantly showing up for it. There's a lot to do every day in both peak performance yep. and peak performance aging. So at the Flow Research Collective, the one comment I said, we train people all over the globe and tens of thousands of people and blah, blah, blah. They have one thing in common. They're all busy. Everybody we work with is busy. Everybody's busy. So we always look for these multi-tool solutions, a single solution that solves multiple problems at once. So really simple example is uh, if you're interested in peak performance, um, regular mindfulness practice really matters because one, a mindfulness practice lowers anxiety levels, which you have to do to be in flow. Two, flow follows focus. It only shows up when all of our attention is in the right here, right now. So anything that helps us train up focus amplifies our ability to get into flow. So mindfulness, single, single problem, single tool, now it solves two problems. It actually solves a whole bunch more problems than just those two, but that's a really sort of simple example of a multi-tool solution. The one I talk about in the book for training, for uh, I used it to train for, for park skiing, but I think it's actually a phenomenal peak performance aging tool, is hiking with a weight vest. Because I, a, it's a single, and I did it because so to save time. I have dogs. I hike my dogs every day. It happens no matter what. So I didn't have, when I was going to train for park skiing, right? I trained for almost a year. I was busy, right? I had a lot going on. So I had to find a way. I didn't, I didn't have time for, and I was already like going to the gym and doing yoga. And around. So like, how am I going to find time for more training? I'm already training. Um, and I was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm hiking my dog an hour a day. Let's add a weight vest in. And that was just where it started. And it originally was, Oh, this will help for leg strength. That was right, leg strength and stamina. And it turns out it does, but it turns out that it's one of the best core training tools I've ever used because it's on your upper torso. Every time you take a step, right, you're hold, you're locking your core in. It also, because of that, it's doing balance and agility. And if you're sort of a little stretching at the front and back end, now you've got all five categories of functional fitness that need to be trained over time. The user to lose its skills, the core. Um, and you, one tool that's training all five things. And if you don't use a single tool, so the World Health Organization has 
very exact prescriptions for peak performance aging for exercise. We know exactly what we need. If you want to be at your best, you need 150 to 300 minutes of moderate to vigorous aerobic activity a week. You need two strength training days and three balance flexibility and agility days. Now, if you're taking your workout seriously, it's pretty hard to get through anything I just listed in less than 20 minutes, and usually they're about 40 minutes, right? So you're looking at two hours of workout time a day, five days a week, or you find a single tool that does multiple things at once, right? Um, and mm. now, now you're starting to cook. So those are really, I just think for time management, you know, multi-tool solutions, having filters, right, for what you're saying yes to and what you're saying no to, knowing sort of what are your core flow triggers, right, and which ones work sort of the best for you, um, and multi-tool solutions, and the other one is stack protocols. A stack protocol is when you can nestle a bunch of tools inside one another. So I use saunas, uh, infrared saunas for recovery. Really phenomenal recovery tool, but one of the reasons I use saunas for recovery is I can go into a sauna, I can bring my Theragun into the sauna so I can massage out my you know, muscles in the sauna, I can meditate in the sauna, and I can also read in the sauna. And for creativity, we find that you wanna be reading 25 to 50 pages a day. This is a peak performance thing, uh, uh, minimum, usually in a book, to load the pattern recognition system, to give your brain the fodder. You can't be creative if, you don't, if you're not feeding the brain the fodder for creativity. And so reading is really the best, one of the best ways to do that. And so here's a single tool, a sauna, right? And you do an infrared sauna, there's slow, slow bakes, right? So you like 40 minutes and I can read my 25 pages. I can do 15 minutes of focused meditation and I can, you know, hit my muscles for five minutes with a Theragun and I'm in a sauna. So I've now, like, I got four things going on inside a single activity. That's a perfectly stacked protocol. So we look at the, at the Flow Research Collective. These are the solutions we're always looking for. That's the stuff I talk about in our country. Um, I don't think, to, so I think you need to do that to perform at your best yeah. over time. Busyness is often the reason that people give for not doing the things that they really aspire to do. Well, yeah, I mean, you know I went right at that in the book. You <laughs> saw that. But in, in the book specifically, you mentioned that the highest performing people that you have the opportunity to study, they have this one thing in common. They're all busy. They are all busy. And so you've you've embedded these mental meals. The, it's, they're not even snacks throughout this ex exploration of this new form of skiing, which I want to get to next. And insights like that, right? And it's just like it stood out. And also filters, right? So being able to process or put our opportunities our request for our time through these mental filters. What are your filters? What are your top things that bring you the most joy in your life? And when you get requests to do things, understanding your time is valuable, especially as you inch towards that finish line of your lifespan, that time becomes something that you should probably consider a lot more of. And you actually did the math on how many more times well, you yeah, have to so ski. So that was where all this, all this started in a weird way with this sort of calendar that you're talking about. So I, this is about 10 years ago now, five years ago, seven years ago, um, I realized that, wow, when there's like five to 10 inches of powder, this is not a big dump, this is a medium sized snow. Um, those are my favorite days on the hill because it allows me to do exactly what I want to do. But those days show up, if I'm lucky, seven times a season. And so I was like, well, wait a minute. I was 50 years old, let's say, at the time I was started this and average male life expectancy is 80 and if this is happening seven times a year and I'm gonna live to be 80 that's 210 more times I get to do my favorite thing on the planet that's not a particularly big number that's really motivating right when you look at it that way and you're like oh my god this is my favorite thing and let's say all my friends who are working on longevity technology and whatever like they get managed to add another 10 years to my life so bonus right so now i get an additional 70 it's still 280 times to do the thing that is the most delicious wonderful thing to me in the world again not a very big number 
right? And so I have a calendar where I just cross off the days. So I know, right? Be grateful, savor them. Don't, don't miss one, right? This has really been about like, also like make sure that like, if these are the conditions, because sometimes when it snows a lot, driving to a ski area is terrifying. Like you're driving through a blizzard over like mountain roads, it's gnarly. And so there's extra, oh shit, I gotta drive through this stuff to get there. And oh, I've got work stuff and, and whatever. And oh, I can go tomorrow and there'll be some left. No, 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 no. You've got 200 left of these days in your life. You don't waste one. Yeah, yeah, wow, it's so powerful. Now this brings us to the title. Can you no, talk about you. what the title means and also what can people expect in this book? Yeah, so, um, the book is about peak performance aging. And I, so one thing, aging is a fact of life, right? Old is a mindset is one thing I want to point out. The second thing is that like a lot of people hear the word old, hear the word aging. And, um, if they're over 50, they've got no problem. They're already like, they, they, they sort of started to come to terms a little bit with, with those words, but if they're under 50, a lot of people are like, oh, no, no, those, those, those words don't apply to me. I, I, like, I don't even want to think about that. I'm shutting that off, that sort of thing. And the thing I want to tell you is maybe, I mean, maybe you want to do that, but one of the things this talk, the book talks about is that peak performance aging starts young, right? There's stuff you want to do in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s. And this is like for quality of life over time for, for, for health and wellness and longevity. But like there's a, there's a lot to it. It's not something that just starts over 40 or over 50. Um, it see, the work seems to start a little earlier, but in our country, so NAR is action sports slang. It's short for gnarly. And uh, that export athletes, as colorful as the language is, it's a technical language and it means very specific things. And action sport athletes are trying to stay alive and out of the hospital in dangerous situations. So these words really have precise meanings. And NAR is actually described as a, any environment that is high in perceived risk and high in actual risk, right? So I think it's dangerous and it's actually really is dangerous. That turns out in country is obviously any landscape or territory or whatever. It turns out it's a really phenomenal description of our later years. High in perceived risk, high in actual risk. And it turns out once you start digging under the hood of peak performance aging and what's going on, it's a phenomenal description of the gritty mindset it takes to thrive in the mm. second half of our life. So that's where the title comes from. And uh, I think it's appropriate, especially because it's an action, a little bit of an action sports book. And what are you taking people through in this book? So. As you pointed out, the book tracks my attempt to learn how to park ski at age 53 is when the quest starts. What is park skiing? Park versus... skiing is the discipline in skiing. So skiing, the way most people think about it, it's like speed skating, right? It's a, you stay in contact with the surface of the earth, you move in one direction, you move down the mountain. And like park skiing is like figure skating. It takes place above the surface of the earth. It involves doing tricks and spins and flips and wall rides and rail rides and riding on boxes and riding on surfaces with your skis and it's super dangerous not super dangerous it's dangerous it's very acrobatic and there's like 11 or 12 different biological reasons that it's supposed to be impossible as i said for anybody much over the age of 40 to learn it and i there was a bunch of stuff and like directly grew out of flow this work just came right i mean it's not like i stumbled into peak performance aging it grew right out of my work and flow and um, so there was a bunch of stuff in flow science that said, hey, wait a minute, this stuff is not true. And a bunch of other things from like network neuroscience and body cognition, and a couple other whiz bang fields. And I was like, this is true. I should be able to onboard really difficult, challenging skills, even in my 50s. And anybody should be able to do it. Um, and I decided to put it to the test. And park skiing was a really, I'm a skier. I was an expert skier, but I'd never been in a train park in my life. I knew no tricks. Well, I had a couple of like retro cool tricks from back when I was like 16 years old, really basic ski tricks, but nobody even throws those tricks anymore because that's 40 years ago. Those tricks are not even cool. Um, so uh, it, it was a really, it was just a really great way to test mm -hmm. these ideas. And you're going to get in this book, there's two things. But the first thing, and the one of the reasons, so it, it's, as you know, the book's sort of written like a diary, right? It goes, it goes, 
almost day by day. It's not really, uh, but it, for the entire period of the experiment. And the, why is that? In peak performance, like if you want more flow in your life, which is the heart of peak performance, I can tell you these are the flow triggers, the 26, and this is how they work. And I can tell you this is the flow cycle, the map of the process, and this is where you are. And that's all you need, plus the peak performance basics, and a couple other ideas to be dangerous. And that answer is incredibly not satisfying to most people because they really want to know about the application, right? Like, okay, but what happens when I show up at work and, you know, I've been sick for two weeks and my boss is in a rage because I haven't been around for two weeks and my knee hurts or, you know, or I show up and I work in a really, really good mood and then like this bad thing happens and it derails me and I have to get into flow from... That's what the book gives you is like a daily recipe. These are, this is where I'm starting. This is the challenge I'm facing. The goal is to get into flow and to use flow to kind of amplify learning and park skiing. So like we, you have a daily recipe for flow with these different applications, which is a thing that um, the folks we are lucky enough to train at the Flow Research Collective have been, want, people have been asking for years. Like my fans have wanted this. Um, people we train have wanted this. There's been a really big demand and nobody's, it's a really hard thing to do. Not from a, anybody could do this, from a writing standpoint, making it enjoyable for a reader and still useful is really, it's actually, a, it's very hard. This is one of those technical, but you would never know it from reading it because the book's a ton of fun. It reads like an adventure story. It's one of those technical books I've ever written for that reason because I wanted to do this in a way that was engaging and fun and, yeah. you know, memorable um, and nobody had ever really done it. Jim Fix at the, the his book on running, uh, the something book on running, I can't remember the name of Jim's book, uh, does it in the last chapter. And my editor was a, he was a runner and it was a huge Jim Fix fan. And he was the one who, like when I started first playing with it, he was like, oh, you're doing that thing Jim did, but Jim only pulled it off for a chapter. Mm -hmm. You know, we started talking about, well, okay, how can we, how can I do this for a book? How can we sustain this and not bore the shit out of readers and everything else? So one, you're going to get a look at the basics of peak performance aging good overview of a of, of very cutting edge field, right? Just emerging now. Um, two, you're gonna get a deep look at like recipes for flow. These are the flow triggers, this is how it works in this situation, this situation, this situation. Um, the other thing you're gonna get is probably, you're gonna laugh a lot. Cause I I tried to make it a funny book. I hope it's a funny book. I, I mean, the, the distance between your ass and the emergency room, <laughs> you know, was funny as hell to me. Good. You know, and so, just to be able, it's very, it's masterful. You know, the Thank writing you. is masterful. You clearly have been doing this for a long time at a high level to imbue those two things together. Because that's what was so fascinating to me and why I was sharing this with my wife, you know, just in conversation. I was like, babe, you know, I know you think this is a book about skiing. Well, that was the other thing is you like, know? I, you know, the number of park skiers in the world, like if there's a half a million of us, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it's a, pretty damn small community and i like if this is just a book about skiing there aren't enough readers in the world for yeah. you know what i mean so i was hoping and i think i did it i don't know but there's you know i, I mean growing up i read all kinds of books about professional football professional but like these are not sports i play right and i'm never gonna so like i read a bunch of books about stuff i didn't play and i loved them and i was thinking about like the that barefoot running book that everybody read mm -hmm. right how many of us run through canyons barefoot, right? Like, so I was thinking about it that way. I was like, well, there've been a whole bunch of books in the, this community um, where people have read about activities outside stuff they're doing because it, it's been a good metaphor. So that's what I hope I did, right? If this thing is just for skiers, I definitely did not do my job. Well, this is, again, bringing about very practical things too for us to immediately apply. Immediately apply. Already, this concept of having these filters changed my life like oh, seriously so great That's and great. in addition to that if you could again i know there's 26 triggers oh no let's talk about a couple but if you could talk yeah, about a couple let's of talk about a couple flow i want to yeah i wanted to so um flow follows focus only shows when our attention is right here right now all the triggers work by driving attention into the present moment now neurobiologically one of three different things is going on or some combination. We focus attention when we're driving dopamine into our system, norepinephrine into our system, a little bit too much blocks it. Or when we lower cognitive load, which is all the crap you're thinking about at any one time. If I lower cognitive load, your brain will immediately repurpose that energy for paying attention to the task at hand. So that's what all the triggers do. 
most of them work by driving dopamine into our system. There's a bunch of different triggers that work this way, and let's just start there. So novelty is a flow trigger because when we encounter anything novel, it we pay attention to it. That's dopamine, right? Risk, physical risk, but also emotional risk, social risk, psychological risk, intellectual risk, spiritual risk, also flow triggers. Um, complexity, when we encounter complexity. So you look up at a night sky and you, you see a billion stars and you realize that most of those stars you're actually looking at are galaxies and you're looking back in time and you're just overwhelmed by the perceptual vastness of it all. That's complexity. And um, again, pushes dopamine into our system. Uh, unpredictability, when unpredictable stuff happens, pushes dopamine into our system. Creativity is a flow trigger. Not really creativity per se, it's pattern recognition. When we link ideas together, that pushes dopamine into our system. We all know this. If you've ever done a crossword puzzle with Sudoku, you get an answer right, that little rush of pleasure you get afterwards, that's dopamine. And um, so all of these are flow triggers. Um, all of them work incredibly well. The most important of flow trigger, flows triggers um, is what's known as the challenge skills balance which is the idea that flow follows focus and we pay most attention to the task at hand, whatever we're doing, when the challenge of the task slightly exceeds our skill set. So you want to stretch, but not snap. If I were to say that emotionally, I'd say flow sort of sits on this midpoint between boredom, there's not enough stimulation here, I'm not paying any attention, and anxiety, whoa, way too much stimulation, I can't stop paying attention. In between is this sweet spot. If you speak physiology, it's the herbs dobson curve. If you speak flow, it's the flow channel, depending on what your science background is. But what's interesting about that and what's cool about it is um, it's the progression ladder, right? And when you're constantly pushing on your skills, you're using your skills to the utmost, you're a little outside your comfort zone. So you want to stay in that sweet spot. You better get comfortable with being uncomfortable because that's where that sweet spot lives. Um, first of all, but uh, what it means is that on the other side of a flow state, because we're using our skills to the utmost, we're growing, we're learning, we're more complex, we're more adaptable, mm -hmm. and we're actually wiser. Flow automatically increases wisdom and empathy um, and these skills as well. So you're getting sort of the whole package, and because there's a global release of nitric oxide on the front end of flow, which makes it an anti-aging technology because it's lowering stress, and because you're building up expertise and wisdom, so you're fighting off cognitive decline and dementia on the back end, all these things make it partially an anti-aging technology. Um, I can go, I, there's one more thing I could add if you want me to round out the anti-aging technology thing or we can go back into the flow trigger. Oh uh, yeah. Okay, so the other <laughs> thing you need to know about flow as an anti-aging technology is whenever we produce really, po really positive, powerful emotions have health benefits. So the most powerful positive emotions that human can encounter, love, connection, a sense of control, we love being in control, and a sense of mastery. And flow, because it advances our skills, you're getting mastery. Flow states have, one of the things we get is it gives us a feeling of control. It's one of the, how do you define flow? How do you know if you're in a flow state? One of the things you have is this feeling of, oh wow, I can control things I can't normally control. From the outside, I look in, I see you in a flow state, you look like you're performing at your best. That's not what it feels like on the inside. Maybe it feels a little bit, but what it really feels like is, oh shit, I can control things mm -hmm. that I can't normally control, right? This could be me as a writer, my words are doing things like a six in the morning on a Tuesday that they don't normally do. It could be a basketball player or something, the, the hoop looks as big as a hula hoop and they can't miss, right? You decide that's a sense of control. When we feel that, that boosts the production of T cells, which boosts the immune system, and natural killer cells, which target sick cells and tumors. So when we're in flow, uh, and all the neurochemicals that show up in flow that I mentioned, they also boost the immune system. So you're boosting the immune system, you're boosting the production of T cells, you're boosting the production of natural killer cells, you're lowering stress levels, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it makes flow a really potent anti-aging medicine and obviously flow underpins happiness and well-being and meaning and purpose and those things really matter and they definitely matter over time right like you're a lot more willing to engage in frivolous exploratory activities when you're younger 
as you age, you start that that clock comes in, and you're like, oh no, I don't want to waste time on less meaningful activities. And I mean, for a lot of us, that starts to happen. I mean, not in our fifties or sixties; it happens in our twenty, late twenties and thirties, right? Um, flow really underpins all that stuff. So really, really potent. But to get more flow, this challenge skills balance is really so. That's uh, again a, one of the things you see in our country is how to constantly be pushing on the challenge skills balance and a, a little bit and how to use a lot of these different flow triggers in different situations and you know when to call them on them and when when not to and, and sure it's working for me on the ski hill but it will work for you in a work environment in a business environment in your interpersonal relationship wherever you want to apply this stuff it'll work i've just used skiing as an example because i've had i've got expert level skills so i know what the I'm talking about right <laughs> yeah. like that was the other thing is that well, this is the other reason nobody's really written this book is you actually need this kind of weird challenge where I went from I would I've expert ski skills but no skills in park skiing which is an adjacent activity so it allowed me I know what I'm talking about in skiing and I just so I could apply it to learning from absolute beginner forward um I found I thought that was really helpful and you um, also have the mastery of writing and communicating this you know what I mean? So it's a pretty dangerous combination. I'm not going to say this is going to happen, but the fact that you created this as a readable f trigger for flow state, in a sense, because it is novel. You know, there's so many different things going oh, it's on. It's a flowy it, book to read. It's a, it's flowy, a flowy book, book. to read. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Is, yeah, you're not the first. So uh, me, I just sent me a high Godfather flow psychology. It's funny because flow is really associated with like athletics a lot and art artistry. And that's off. Like that's my fault and Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's fault because we liked writing about sport examples and art examples. And it turns out like flow shows up everywhere. In fact, mm. Csikszentmihalyi pointed out years ago in the 70s, the most common flow state on earth is reading. It's the most mm. common flow state on earth. Amazing. Second most common flow state on earth, two middle managers at work lost in conversation. Interesting. Right, like interpersonal flow when you get in, you and your friends start talking and you get so sucked into what you're doing a couple hours go by. But if you think about inter, that, those conversations at work, well, there's risk baked into them because there's always money involved and a little bit of pressure. And so you got a bunch of those flow triggers sort of baked into those conversations. And that's so reading and, and, and conversations at work tend to be the places, at least micro flow, the low grade version of the state show up the most. Well, um, we got to get people to pick up this flowy book in our country right now. Where can people pick up the book and also just get more, get more. into yeah, yeah. this information? Yeah, yeah. So um, the book's available anywhere. Books are sold. You can get it from Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Support your local independent bookstore if you can. Um, if you uh, if you're interested in learning more about flow, flow training, you want to work with the Flow Research Collective. Danger, cheesy URL ahead, but it sticks in your brain getmoreflow.com is where to go. You can go there. You can sign up for a, like a free hour long uh, coaching call with any of my coaches. So they'll just literally get on the phone with you. They'll talk to you about where you are in your life, the stuff we do. Maybe it's a fit. Maybe it's not a fit. There's, it's not high pressure at all. We don't like people love these coaching calls. I'm not trying to put you into like a marketing situation. In fact, if that happens to you, you let me know and I'll fire the person who did it. <laughs> um, but uh uh, stephencotler.com is me flowresearchcollective.com is that organization and there's a website for, for narcountry.com and uh, the thing that's fun on the website I just want to say is so we developed a whole protocol right to teach myself to how to park ski and, and it worked for me uh, it worked for Ryan who's sitting off screen here who's my ski partner um, he we, both of us like got farther faster than we've ever gone before which was amazing but that's not that's a pilot study it's a very small pilot study so we came back the following year we re-ran the study with 17 older adults ages uh 29 to 68 and if you go to narcountry.com we had a national geographic uh photographer filmmaker follow us around we filmed everything so you can see a video of you know a bunch of people who had then the difference with them and one of the things that was really exciting about it is uh most of them were intermediates so they weren't even like expert level you know they they came in as intermediates and we still got them zero to 60 and it's not that park skiing is a great actually peak performance aging tool action sports are really good for peak performance aging because 
their dynamic motion. They check all those boxes. They, they, they hit all the things that one sentence I gave you earlier. Action sports tend to fit in that box. A um, bunch of other sports do, do as well, but action sports sit really nicely uh, in that box. But um, I do think this kind of NAR style mission where I had unfinished business in skiing, right? So I had extra motivation on top of like, you know, I had my powder calendar. I had, you know, stuff from my childhood to talk a little bit about that in the book. There was a lot of motivation going in for park skiing. It was a really good activity, but I think what you, you, you want to create it. You want to find this NAR style activity where it'll take your like traditional mindset around aging, right? This, whatever ideas you have and just explode the possibility space, right? That was the, that was the real thing that was amazing to me is like, I had a really good, like, so Portland's mindset, positive mindset towards aging. I'm thrilled with the, what's ahead of me in my life leads to an additional seven and a half to eight years of healthy longevity. It's a huge mm -hmm. lever and it being exposed to negative stereotypes of aging or having it right. So they've looked at, uh, ageism is the most common stereotype in the world. And they've looked at the impact of, of ageism. And if you're exposed to negative stereotypes around aging in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, by the time you get to your 60s, if you internalize them, you're going to show 30% greater memory deficits than people who are not exposed to negative stereotypes around aging and have a positive mindset towards aging. So there's a bunch in the book about how do you change your mindset, and there's a bunch of different techniques, but here's the truth. Mindsets are really freaking hard to change. We hear a lot about, oh, you need a growth mindset, and you need the, this and this, and people throw it around in, in positive psychology and all this stuff as if changing your mindset was like changing your underwear, and it's just not. And there are stuff you can do. you got to sort of police your language. Mindfulness helps. But I find that, like, a NAR style quest, like, once I started learning Nose Butter 360, some of these other more complicated tricks – whatever I thought might have been possible for me in the second half of my life, it exploded, right? Because suddenly there was a whole lot. I was like, oh my God, because if this is possible, and this is possible, and like, as you noticed, I learned a lot of that stuff really fast, right? That was the other thing, like our peak performance aging formula works so well that like, I thought it was going to take me five years. It took me a season mm -hmm. to onboard these skills. It was remarkably fast. And once I started, you know, halfway through the season, I was like, oh my God. What, and I had, I thought I had a really positive mindset towards aging and what was ahead of me in the second half of my life, but I had to totally revisit what might be possible in the face of my own success. That's why this kind of NARS I mean, you don't have to learn how to park ski, but you should pick a challenge yeah. that will explode your, whatever your mindset is. I think that's really helpful. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to stay connected and learn from people like you who are doing these things and expressing what's possible that's one of the other things is having healthy examples or models of what's possible for us, you know, moving forward and really changing the culture around aging, aging healthfully, and just really getting the most out of this life. And so everybody pick up a copy of NAR Country and make sure that you are following. Also, are you on social? Yeah, Stephen Kotler on Instagram. Stephen Kotler on Instagram. And the website again was? Getmoreflow.com. Uh, if you want to check out our trainings, flowresearchcollective.com, stephencotler.com. There's a NAR Country website, narcountry.com. Um, and you can find me on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here to optimize your mindset and to achieve your goals faster. People say to me, well, why do you do your meditations in the morning? I always say, easy. Because if I can overcome myself at the beginning of the day, the rest of the day is easy. That's the biggest mastery, right, Absolutely. is the self.